Um, first of all, I'd just like to welcome all of you. I feel that we have, we're very fortunate to have these incredible women. These are really incredible women here, um, just listening to their, their credentials. Um, so I want to thank all of you for being here. Thank you for taking the time. We're all busy, and I greatly appreciate it. And I know that these people appreciate it. Um, I am going to just put a quick plug in. Make sure that if you're not a member, you join. This is an important organization. And I will be joining today as well. Uh, and I look forward to anyone else who wants to join should. I think we're going to, uh, Ava, we're going to find someone who will tell us at the front desk. OK. Um, just a little bit about this whole idea of my life in art. Um, when I thought about it, uh, the first person that I called was Constance. Um, because I think that there are so many different angles when we look at art particularly in, if you look at it in all the different areas that we're thinking about, where we're talking about an artist, a curator, educator, and a, and a gallerist. So I think you're going to find this interesting today. This is, um, Laura Addison has been kind enough to draft these questions. We were given these questions a little bit ahead of time. I can't guarantee how they're all going to come out. She's warned me <laughs> that we never know. Um, anyway, without further ado, thank you for being here, Laura. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you, New Mexico Committee. Um, thank you both for everything you do for New Mexico Arts. I'm so pleased to be here today. So you heard Russ give the biographical sketches of everyone here at the table, um, and you should have, ha you should have uh, a pamphlet on your chair that describes everybody's bios in more depth. But I want to delve a little deeper first. And so the first question that I want to pose to the panelists is, was there a moment that you can identify when you knew that you wanted to be an artist, an art historian, critic, a gallerist? Don't be shy. <laughs> well, then you want to start? Somebody start here, yeah. <laughs> well, I grew up in a relatively small town with no art museum whatsoever. And I was in my late teens before I even put one foot in an art museum. And that was the uh, Dallas Museum of Fine Arts. And uh, I was captivated by an Andrew Wyeth painting. <laughs> so uh, that's when I got interested in art. Um, and then I went to do my undergraduate studies, first at uh, Texas Tech, and my art history classes there. Um, I think I went in as an art major and immediately switched to art history. And that was it. Pretty simple. Well, I guess I could say, I grew up in a small town, too, uh, on the border of Wisconsin in northern Illinois. And for me, um, my introduction to art was Catholicism. My church was just uh, gold-leafed, and there were candles and flowers, and the priests wore satin, and oh, it was just fantastic. So. I would call that the Baroque side of my introduction to art. And then um, my other introduction was I lived across the street from a Mennonite quilt maker. And she um, allowed me to come since from third grade, starting in third grade, every day after school. And I would arrange, she just made simple square quilts. Think. Albers, Joseph Albers color relationship. And I would go there every day and I would rearrange these squares and it would take me months to get the top to where I thought it was perfect. And then she would make them. I mean, to me, that was miraculous. And that was like sort of being the curator. There's this whole team behind you, you know? Somebody else doing all the work. And I say, but when, if I think of the first curatorial thing I did, was probably my own closet. And my mother, <laughs> <laughs> my mother was very indulgent. I mean, she wasn't good. She wasn't, uh, you know, kind of like the. Uh, she let me do a lot of things. So one year it was all blue. I took everything else out of my closet. Another two years it was roses and oranges and greens. And that's all I would have in my closet. So these were things. But when I, um, in terms of my introduction, really came through a, another art historian, um, Sheldon Reich at the University of Arizona. He was the uh, 
did the Marin catalog resume, did a lot of work on um, uh, Dosberg. And what was important to me was I did not want to be an Easterner. My great aunt homesteaded in Arizona in the teens. She was a rancher. I knew I was a Westerner. And to find this kind of, of scholarship in, uh, at the University of Arizona was fantastic to me. He was an incredible teacher. So I thought, this is all I want to do, is look at slides in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and, then of course, and then, of course, I went to all the great museums. And that, that was essential. In my era, it was so easy to travel. It was not hard like it is now. <laughs> it was easy. So you got to go and look at all the great collections. So Libby and Malin, did either of you ever aspire to be an artist? I did at first, but I, actually I don't remember aspiring to be an artist. I think I wanted to be a fashion designer, which is so wrong, so wrong for me. But uh, uh, I think I, I was one of those kids that go, oh, college is going to be hard. I'll be an art major, <laughs> you know. So uh, it literally, but then, you know, like I say, right away I took to the art history classes much more so. Charlie? Um, I started as a working artist and um, in ceramics, and I had a, a just a wonderful mentor. She was a fabulous woman on the East Coast. I grew up in New York, and um, she was incredible. She lived on Staten Island, and every day I'd go to Staten Island to work with her, and um, I eventually ended up teaching with her at Staten Island Community College. Um, but I realized as I was progressing in my art career that I wasn't very good, really. It was, I knew that this was probably not my real calling. Um, and so I had an opportunity to become involved with the museum and found that I was very good at raising money. And of course that sort of led to a whole 10 years of raising money for institutions. Um, I moved to New Mexico in um, uh, oh early mid '80s, and um, it was during that time I moved here to raise money for for a foundation. And it was during the time of me leaving New Mexico that I actually became involved with a gallery, and I realized then that this was my calling. I loved it. I loved the work. I loved working with the artists. I, I loved everything. I, I realized I was a people person, which I'd sort of never really thought about before. Um, and so it was really the beginning of my exploration in terms of gallery life and what that means and the commitment, commitment it means to the people that you bring into the gallery. And um, I continue to do it with joy. And I think um, for me, and, I, and, and maybe for a lot of artists, it's not anything that we choose because it's a pretty <laughs> tough way. Um, but my, am I getting feedback because I'm feeling it? Oh, okay. Um, that it's just a growing awareness of what it is you want to do, not what you want to maybe be. I'm not, I never chose, never thought about being an artist, but I had this desire to create things, to make things that just was intense and really fun and beyond fun. It was, had a depth to it that I didn't, uh, I didn't experience with any other kind of activity that, that I found was fun or interesting. It, it had these levels to it that no other activity had. And so I just wanted to keep doing that and keep doing that. And so by the time college came around, of course, I took art courses as well as everything else. And that was just, I came, I came alive in those classes. And so um, I just followed that. And I think that while, since we're here talking about the female experience um, versus the male experience, you know, I think that in going to college, at this stage, it's almost easier for a woman to decide to pursue art because it does not guarantee an income. And where men are under more pressure to guarantee an income. And so they may choose other things. So in the beginning, I think it might be an advantage um, to be a female in this. You, there's less pressure to do other things in a certain way. You feel more, a little more free to go. 
then something else has to take over once you get out of college, and that's a determination to stay with it. And so um, for me, um, I just seemed to have that determination. I didn't have any uh, feeling about being a, a mother or, or a wife, um, right, you know. I didn't have those huge urges. And I think that that actually helped me at the earlier stages. Not that these things aren't good and can't be incorporated beautifully into one's life. I, I do think it was, it helped me in the beginning because it, I, I just wanted so much to do this thing, make these things and see what happened. And so it was never a moment that occurred to me to be an artist. It was just continuing to go where I felt alive and not worry about what that might mean other than how could it be bad. And was uh, being faculty at a university a means to an end? That came after. Um, I, I do teach at a university. And, um, and it's interesting, as we all, all brought that up, that I think that they are important institutions for, uh, for at least for this panel, and maybe for a lot of people, to g become acquainted with art and, what, and yourself. And uh, I, did, I got out of uh, graduate school. And just, um, I made a pact with poverty. I said it would be my friend, <laughs> and that I would embrace it as my freedom. I would really take it on as a, as a legitimate and honorable thing. So I got my expenses way, way down, so that I could have only uh, minor jobs. Jobs, I always tell my students, get a job you're embarrassed to have. You know, because then you won't invest your energy and your ego in it. Just get delivering this package from here to there. That's a good job and then go home. And so um, I just got a low kind of job and lived. So I had a lot of time, a lot of time to waste because you have to be able to have a mental um, capacity to, to create a, a place for you to fail all the time, not make money, um, not be productive, but of course you're there working every single second. So it's really hard work, uh, but it, it doesn't have uh, the benefits of what other people's hard work gets them, perhaps. So you have to stick it out. Um, I don't know what your original question was. But. Now, did you have any mentors or role models that pointed the way for you? No. That's something that I know comes up quite a lot when talking about opportunities for women in the arts, and that is that there's generally been a sort of paucity of um, mentors, that there needs to be more of a network uh, for women working in the arts. I think there must be now. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in school, there were no professors that were women. And so, and, and my great, one of my great teachers, I had a terrific relationship with, with him, and he just thought I did great work, and top of the class, and you know, it was metal. And uh, you know, I was graduating, I said, well, you know, what should I do, what should I do? And with genuine, loving me and genuine care, he said, Marry well. <laughs> right. OK. What about anyone else? Mentors or role models who made a difference in your path? A lot of mentors, a lot of really good mentors. Um, the first of my mentors were my peers who were, uh, I had a fellowship at the um, in edu museum education at the Toledo Museum of Art. And anybody who knows the Toledo Museum of Art knows what a great collection it is. And there were seven of us that year. And they've been totally important to me in my whole career. The, the, they included um, Christopher Knight, who's the critic for the LA Times, Stephanie Barron, who's the great curator at the um, Los Angeles County Museum, Lisa Lyons, who's director of the land. And so these were, we were mentors to each other. And then um, I worked, uh, that year I was there at the Toledo Museum of Art, we curated two shows. And um, I wrote a letter off to uh, Stena Vasolka in New York the video artist, and this was in 72, and they were just running the kitchen. And I said, I'd like to include one of their works at the, the Toledo Museum uh, Fellows show. And she sent me, she didn't answer me, she sent me a tape. At that time, video was taped. She didn't, there was no question. 
And um, then they moved here in 79, and I've worked with them ever since on shows internationally. So Steen has always been a mentor to me. And Beaumont Newhall, who was uh, the great uh, founder of the photo department historian. And um, after he retired, I was his assistant here in Santa Fe. And he was absolutely firm about backing the women who were his students. Because his wife, Nancy, when he went into World War II from the MoMA, um, Mo MoMA paid her half of what it paid him. And she worked twice as hard. She did the first Strand show, the first Weston show. So he always said to me, you have to toot your own horn more, Melin. You don't toot your own horn. I still don't do that. But it was, he said, and, I, and he wrote letters for all of his women students. And he helped them get good positions. And so he was a great mentor to me. And uh, Peter Walsh at uh, UNM was another wonderful mentor to me. Um, he always said, you like me? for a boss because I always do what you tell me to do. <laughs> I said, exactly. <laughs> you get me the resources I need. You support what I want to do. And, um, and then my husband. These are all men who are feminists. And so they were mentors to me. So I just wanted to mention them. Libby, have you ever had a boss like that? I wish. They do everything. <laughs> I wish. No, honestly, you know, I've had a lot of role models in the field, but, um, you know, I, I will say that um, I had very happy relations with my professors, but, and I would be at the top of the class, but I would be passed over for their little darling boys for scholarships and um, like that. So... I had really good experiences and learned a lot and, you know, like that. But um, I will say that I did experience that level of sexism. Mm -hmm. Was it ever addressed? Did they ever provide a justification? Uh, sorry, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you know, like I might have really self-evidently, completely, apparently, outperformed all the other students in some areas. And, uh, but it was a little different thing. I can't, I can't say that it was entirely sexism because there were gay issues involved and things like that. So, uh, but, you know, so for that reason, I can't say that anybody like, put their arm around me and helped me into a professional life, no. Charlotte, you mentioned... Um... I, there were two women in my life that early on that said, yes, you can. And I think, I just want to make this statement because I think it's really an important, I'm hearing it with a, a couple of it, particularly with you, Libby. Um, you know, I think that women, oftentimes we don't say to ourselves, yes, we can. Maybe we do at home in the mirror. Uh, but we get into an environment where we don't say, yes, you can, and we don't actually stand up and say that in an environment like you're suggesting that, uh, that happened. And I've had it happen to me numerous times as well. Um, so for me, I was lucky that I did have um, two women that basically said, yes, you can. You can do this. You can, you can, you can take on this role and do it. And I also had a mother who... Um, was a phenomenal woman. She was a feminist, and she started a PhD program for older women going back to school who couldn't afford to go to school. Uh, and she said, yes, you can. And so it was those people that said, yes, you can. You can do whatever you want, um, you know, that gave me the strength to do the, some of the things that I've done um, on a shoestring budget oftentimes. So I would say those, that was the people. So feminism has shaped your career in some way? In a sense, yes. I mean, I'm from that generation, you know. I think most of us are from that generation where it was something that we were um, aware of, you know, at a certain point. Um, you know, I remember the Gorilla Girls, you know, uh, and that whole, that whole thing that happened um, in the 60s and 70s. So, I'm aware of it, and, it, and I, tr I should be more aware of it, and I constantly call myself on this, because sometimes I forget. 
Constance, have you ever encountered any obstacles, maybe particularly in academia, because you're a woman? I can't point to an obstacle in the way historically women could, who were not allowed to take life drawing classes can point to. I think it's just more of a, a general pervasive attitude in the culture at large. And it's just these, you know, I was thinking, uh, I was watching The Wizard of Oz again, and I, and I realized, oh, this is great because it's a, a woman, a girl's adventure. You know, I never really thought of it, I don't know why, but I hadn't thought of it that way. And it's like the queen and another queen, bad queen, good queen, it's all women. You know? And so I thought, this is great, you know, in the 30s or whenever it was. And then I thought, well, what's the message of this story? And then I realized it's stay home. <laughs> it is. There's no place like home. And the whole point is, ah, I shouldn't have left. I shouldn't have left. I should have stayed home. You know? So it is. And so I, I just think that there's this general thing, whether we even know it or we know it so much, it's painful. In other countries, what happens? Or what, and even if something is horribly repressive in another culture, even though it's not in our neighborhood, it still mentally and psychically affects us in terms of just our mental energy, our emotional energy. Our, and if, if certain things can be happening, just even knowing about it affects you in your confidence in, in, in certain things. It doesn't mean you can't overcome them, but they must be overcome. I mean, you, you, you must be aware of it understand it. I would say too that um, feminism has played a huge role in um, improving the relations in the art world. I mean our department is vast majority are women and I think that has a lot to do with the fact I know this was important for me early in my career too in the late 70s and 80s feminism became a, a topic of artists, you know, a feminist art, it's called. There were different brands. I didn't approve of all of them. But um, I generally sided with the postmodern or deconstructionist uh, feminists, like you were just talking about. You saw the code in the queen and her role in the, in the uh, home or, or castle or whatever it is. Um, and uh, a big part of the way feminists incorporated postmodern or deconstructionist theory like Cindy Sherman, Barbara Kruger, um, Sherry Levine, uh, was to basically decode uh, the way that images um, basically codify femininity as patriarchal structures. So this is, remains a, a big part of teaching of art history. I think that's a, I see it open eyes. It's a bit problematic in a heavy studio program because you can't keep making you know, deconstructing feminism in art, you know, how many times can you put a noose around Barbie? Okay, but the thing <laughs> is, uh, you know, but for, um, it's now part of our intellectual history, and I think that because I can't imagine a woman going through an art history undergrad or grad program without deep reference to these, this period in the 70s and 80s, um, they learn about, at a very sophisticated level, because there were a lot of French continental theories that come into it, uh, they learn about those theories and they come to recognize the codes that affect women and the broader culture. And so I think that makes them a lot more fearless um, when they come into the professional world. And I think that has really improved um, art departments across the nation. I don't know that it's improved museums. I I'm just from my own experience so. in museums, my last museum job was at the McNay in San Antonio. And when I went there in 99, um, I was hired. I knew it was going to be a lot of work because I, uh, I was hired for two full-time jobs. And um, uh, I was going to be their first curator of art after 1945 or contemporary art. So in a way, starting a whole department. Um, and I had uh, also was curator of all changing exhibitions. And it's a big museum with 12 changing exhibitions a year. So I knew that I had these two jobs and um, seven people who uh, reported to me. So as a supervisor of seven people. So I knew it was going to be a lot of work. And so it's uh, seven days a week because there's always programs at night. There's always programs on the weekends. You don't get off. You still have to come to the meeting at 8.30 in the morning on 
Mondays, you know, you're traveling with, uh, I was on the um, building committee for the new wing. I had to uh, start a whole support group for the museum. I, I mean, it was just, so I ended up having four full-time jobs. <laughs> and I went to the director and I said, you know, I, I signed up for two full-time jobs and now I have four. Would you agree? Because um, I'm not shy. And he said, no, I would say that's, and I said, is it ever going to change? I mean, you know, this is kind of unreasonable. You're, I'm going to burn out. I don't see how somebody can do this. He said, it's not going to change. So <laughs> when I was put on the building committee, one of our, my, the other uh, women in the museum, who was also a long-term, very valuable employee, um, she said that she had never gotten a good performance review. And I, I had been told a few times by the director, oh, don't say that again. You already told me that once. And you're so negative about that. I said, well, because nothing's been done about it, right? It, I'm repeating myself because nothing has changed, right? So, uh, and the director was a man, yes. I'm assuming. So he's saying, nothing has changed. And I, and I said, I thought you hired me because I was a professional and you wanted to hear feedback from me. Well, well, well. So now this other person who was also put in the building committee with me, who'd gotten a negative performance review, this a woman, for 10 years, she oh said. God. She said, when, I'm going to try and experiment this year, Melin. She said, I'm going to sit in all of the meetings for the new building, and I'm not going to say one word the entire year. She got a great performance review. <laughs> she got a performance review that said, you've been so cooperative this year. <laughs> And I don't know if you've been reading any of the Harper's Magazine. A friend of mine, Rebecca Sullivan, writes for them. And she's been doing a lot on the uh, kind of glass ceiling and difficulties for women in Silicon Valley. And I feel that that's all still there in the museum world. So do you think Santa Fe is a little bit of a bubble in that sense? Because so you, look at the, you look at the leadership right. in in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I have worked and, in a museum since 1973 here. <laughs> but if you look at, say, the four state art museums in Santa Fe, three, right. of, the, three of the directors are women. Well, you worked there. So you I worked me. there. Well, I mean, it feels to me that in terms of the staffing, it's heavily populated by women, the right. museums. Maybe New Mexico is unique in that. Um, I, I don't have a way to gauge that. But, right. and, and the same is true of leadership. So a lot of times um, in a particular industry, um, women might get stuck in middle management, um, that the opportunities for greater leadership are limited for them. Um, but I don't sense that here. I mean, we've got, we've got Patsy right here, who is the director of another mu art museum. Right, right. And I, I see, but maybe this is a unique situation. Well, it could sure. also be because New Mexico museums are so poorly uh, paid. Poorly paid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was That's true, true, though. I mean, <laughs> that, you know, I think that women I think. are the only ones who will take these jobs and live in a, a, a community where it's so expensive to live. I think that's one reason UNM has so many women in the department. Right. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think it's worked out well for UNM. I think, <laughs> think it's worked Don't out well. Don't know about for the women. But, uh, I think it bears a little uh, thought about if there are so many women in leadership positions in museums and such, how come women are underrepresented to such a degree in these same museums? And I have a thought about that. And it goes back to a book written by Dorothea, Dorothy Dinnerstein, The Mermaid and the Minotaur. And in that book, and I'm going to take liberties, that because we're all raised by the female, our first, our, our, intense, our intense relationship is with the female, whether we're women, or boys or girls, it does, you know, it's just there. They give us the world and they take it away. They love us, they reject us. I mean, all these deep, 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 deep things. And I think we all, I, I don't think, 
and I think this is also in the book, I don't think that men are more sexist than women, against women. I think it's shared. I think it's a cultural phenomenon within all of us as individuals to have this deep, difficult relationship with that called the female. And I, and I think that women can have these feelings about women in the same way men do. And they might even have it more deeply <laughs> because they are brought up with fe these feelings. Men learn them. Women experience them. We experience, you need to look pretty. You need a da da da. Um, two people raise their hands, the boy's hand, you know. We, we experience this over and over, and so it's more ingrained to us in, into us. And while we may have empathy and we really want to, to help out, we still, I think, have that in us. And I think women need to, ad it would be helpful to address that, to think about it. Is that, could that possibly be true? Could we possibly be part of that in terms of our own self-confidence and having confidence in this young artist starting out. Like, who's gonna bet on the artist? I, I own a gallery, it cost me $10,000 a month in rent. I got two artists to choose from. Who's the better bet? Who is gonna pay off? I know it sounds really crass, but I think it happens a lot of times when we just have more confidence you know, I, in men than women. I have to say women. that one thing that I think would help women a lot uh, that I have seen, um, for example, I, I know very uh, prominent collectors who are black and who buy black art. I know very prominent gay collectors who are gay and they create collections of gay art. I can't name a single woman that I've encountered and I've been around um, who collects women's art. Now, that kind of separatism, some can say, is ghettoizing in any form, but it helps, actually. So um, I know at one point Jessie Norman, the opera singer, was doing that. She did my work. Mm -hmm. No, no, I can't even know. I'm, and glad, I'm glad there's one. And there's <laughs> another woman. There's a woman so there are some. that collects woman only Florida. women artists. She, she, I know her because she collected Florence Pierce. But, you know, all early, early women yeah, artists. I guess what I'm but saying it's is frightening that we can say it on one, one hand. I know one I know, person. I know one person in Connecticut. Well, I know one yeah. person. No, but what I'm saying so is I right. think women need to support women. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's something that the New Mexico organization here is doing. Now, Charlotte, is that something thing. you're aware of as, well, as you're developing the artists who you represent? Is it's that an something you think it's about? A, it is something that actually came to my mind recently. Um, I do want to just mention that in business, I have had a very interesting um, kind of thing happen to me over and over again when I go to an art fair. Um, we do art fairs. Uh, I don't do as many as I used to, but we do some. And when I would go to Miami, uh, my brother, who um, is not in the art field, he's an investment banker out of New York, um, but he would go down and help me. You know, because it's a lot of moving stuff around. It's heavy work, and it's, you know, it's big just, work. it's big work. So he would meet me down there, and he would help me put everything together, and then he would get dressed in a suit, and I would be in my suit, and my name was on the booth. And, you know, he's about 6'2", six, 6'3", six, maybe tall, handsome guy. And, um, uh. you know, we would be, you know, standing there waiting for the people to come into the booth. And they would immediately come in and walk over to my brother, Bruce. And I'm just standing there. And there are people waiting to talk to him. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture? That's my name there. He's my brother. What's going on here? And it's a peculiar. And we have ended up laughing about it through the years because um, it always happens. And uh, it's a good thing that he does his homework before he goes down there. And actually, he turned out to be quite a good salesperson. But um, <laughs> in the long run, it has been a very interesting thing where you just see it so, so blatantly. Um, and I find that interesting. And I've had it happen in other kinds of things where I'm in the same room with, with, um, with other men, possibly. I don't want to be, make it sound like I'm doing this whole thing of bashing 
other, my colleagues, my male colleagues, because that's not true. I've had male colleagues who have been extremely generous to me and very supportive. Um, and so I, I can't say that's across the board, but I do find it interesting that when people come to the booth, they always ask for Bruce. Um, on the other hand, in terms of what the gallery does with women versus men, I actually had to stop and count today, this morning, because I couldn't remember what the statistic was on my website of how many women versus men that we represent. And um, I represent two more men than I do women. Um, I have had great women in my art, in, my, in the gallery, um, and I work very hard on their behalf, certainly Florence Pierce, who was um, on some level, she was a mentor to me as well. Um, and she was, you know, an artist who early on struggled with, she was the only one in the transcendental group in Taos. Um, and so, you know, there were lessons that she talked about with me, but when I look at what the, the, you know, sort of the makeup of the gallery, I realize that um, sometimes I'm probably not, I don't think, I guess I don't think of it as male, female, and I don't see it that way. Um, when I think of Constance's work, and this was a, a something that, I, I mean, I don't necessarily think, sorry, Constance, I don't think of you necessarily as a woman, because you do these, <laughs> I, this is a bad thing to say, and she does huge, monumental, steel and aluminum and major works that half the men I know couldn't conquer. And so I don't, th I don't see it that way. I don't see it as a male-female um, kind of thing, I guess. But it is something that I've become aware of recently um, because I, I've thought about doing um, a show called Women I Admire. And um, I was sort of looking through my roster of artists and thought, hmm, well, this is interesting. I think I have more men than I do women. So Anne is out there somewhere, Anne Appleby. I'm sure, yes, and she's probably thinking the same thing. Um, but it is something that I have given thought to. I want to reflect back something that I, I feel that I'm hearing from the panelists, which is that perhaps statistically, uh, perhaps even legally, um, there, aren't the, there, there isn't the blatant sexism and dis discrimination experienced, but it exists in small acts um, and perhaps pervasive, which is what you used. Um, it's, it's sort of more diluted, but it's always present and it's always there. Does that seem to, to fit what your experience is and what your observations are? Well, I think that is uh, the great challenge of feminism is that it is so, per I mean, that sexism is so pervasive and it's hidden in, um, you know, a lot of different ways. Um, you know, one of the really important documents that a lot of feminists read uh, in the late 70s was Laura Mulvey's, um, what's the name of it, uh, Narrative and, no, Pleasure and Visual, something, Visual Cinema. Pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, okay. Um, you know, in which she rightly observed that in classical Hollywood movies, there, I mean, there are a lot of things, but one I'll focus on, is that women are passive and men are active. The man's out on the horse and the woman's in the cabin. Um, when women are active, I mean, if you, if you read Mulvey and then look at a lot of films from the 30s, 40s, 50s, God, I mean, it's just like, how could I not have noticed? Um, you know, and um, women react, men act, so men take action, you know, they do things, and women go, oh no, oh, you know, like this. Okay, <laughs> it's true, I mean, it's over and over. And these are the kind of uh, systems or codes that are hidden in the broader culture uh, that you don't see. But, you know, in some cases, you know, like I had a work incident, you know, after I got out of undergraduate, and I went to work for a, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, where we did uh, paste up in magazines and things like that. <laughs> so I was working so hard and we had a lot of work come in and so they hired me a male assistant who was 19 years old and they paid him more than they paid me. <laughs> and you asked me, did I say anything? Oh, you betcha. What happened? They reduced his salary. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. 
you know, and he thanked me too, a lot. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so there's the obvious, but then there is that pervasive kind of thing. Yeah. But I, may I add, um, I, I just think that even if those differences are there, I think you work with them. I mean, if you go, <laughs> you may hate me for this, but if you take it down to the most primal level, the egg and the sperm, Okay, the sperm are single-minded. They're going for it, <laughs> and they're really going what for are you it. Talking about? Sperm. <laughs> You've seen those little tea, those shows where they show the egg and the sperm, and the egg just sits there. Very uh, attractive, attracting, attracting, knowing all wisdom, making judgments, and finally allowing that one <laughs> pathetic soul. <laughs> to make their way in. <laughs> well, that's why I tell my students, don't chase after men. You're not supposed to. It's against the laws of nature. <laughs> but at any rate, but it, let's, say that that, let's say that that very primal thing motivates us. And let's say men are more aggressive. And let's say women are more nurturing. Let's say these are the differences. Perhaps they are in some people more and le or less. I think the question isn't how do we adapt their behaviors or some other kind of behaviors, but how do we work with, with their natural instincts as they are and not turn into something that we aren't to get that prize? You know, that you can't become, I think it was Linda Durham told me once, you, she said, uh, well, I always tell people, a woman will never be uh, a very good man. <laughs> you, know, you can't, you're never gonna be able to compete that way. Just be a really good woman, you know? And I, I just think we, there are tendencies that separate obviously, um, you know, these genders. Um, and it's just how to work within a system that perhaps favors one over the other. And um, you can modify, but strengthen those things that you, that you have and work with those. Because um, I, I, I think yeah, these no, things I come out of somewhere. You know, I, I, I think um, I agree with you in the sense that um, a lot of feminist theory, but not all, uh, wants to view the sex relations as symmetrical. And certainly, I think in terms of courtship rituals in our culture, which will forever be important, I think, um, it's simply not symmetrical. And um, so I do think more work needs to be done. On the other hand, um, I think that feminism as a whole should be a kind of equal under the law sort of thing. So there are power positions and submissive positions, but you don't have to tie that to biology. So, um, in any case, um, I like your sperm story, though. Well, it's that. just, it's, it's so basic, you know. <laughs> I, I, I also think that, um, you know, it is the way women versus men are brought up. And I know that there have been studies of girls who go to all-girls schools versus co-ed schools and that they actually raise their hand a whole lot more. Um, and if you've read uh, Cheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, Lean In, Lean In, um, she, it is what she talks about, and she talks about that issue of, you know, do we sit at the table or do we sit off to the side? And um, I think that a lot of times we have to take the responsibility to sit at the table. Absolutely. And I think maybe that's what you're saying, Constance. We have to be responsible for ourselves and sit at the table. Yeah, sit at the table, but be yourself. Yep. You know, be more nurturing at the table if you wish. That's easy. You don't to have say, to be, right, ladies. <laughs> but you can. Sit at the table. But you're not. We have more money. Yeah. Uh -huh. We're not. Yeah. <laughs> so let me take this pause. To, shall we move on to another topic? Is that me? Okay. Um, we only have a, about 10, 15 minutes remaining. So here's a quick question. What do you think makes a great artist, a great curator, a great art historian, a great writer, a great gallerist? You can respond to whatever your own occupation is or somebody else at the table. You might respond why you think, what you think makes Constance a great artist. No. I think <laughs> what makes a great artist is an independence of mind. I think that's the first thing. I think independence of independent, mind. Independent mind. And then that takes care of a lot of stuff. I think it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate on that a little bit? No. You mean for an artist? 
It's Bernard? just magic. <laughs> uh, I'd say kind of a ruthless honesty. And I would say passion about what it is that you're doing and the people that you work for. And the gallerist works for the artist. That's my job. So what are the, what are the biggest challenges facing your field right now? Auctions. <laughs> As a gallerist, um, you know, I mean, I've had my gallery for over 25 years. And I've sort of gone through the best of times and the worst of times and the best of, you know, it, it's cyclical and it goes back and forth. And um, I think for me, um, trying to stay focused, I've always had a relatively se severe program. Um, there, was a, a, there was a time when I only did monochromatic, uh, I only represented monochromatic work and someone came to me and said, what are you, nuts? I mean, who, who buys this? You know, why do you do this to yourself? You could make a lot more money if you sold other things. And I said, yeah, well, you know, I have to be true to what my beliefs are and what I feel committed to. And, um, you know, I think that continuing, for me, continuing that and, and trying to stay on that path um, and going forward, there are things that, you know, are of interest to me that I continue to add to what I do. But I would say, for me, you know, really committing to what, what I feel my program is and, and being responsible for my artists. Malin? Um, let's see. I'm you, always, you have many fields. I know. I'm constantly, <laughs> I'm constantly reorienting. Um, I've been very, uh, I mean, I was very disheartened during the theory uh, phase where everything was about theory and nothing was about material and, and sensuality and space. And uh, I mean, you know, it's just too much. Uh, it, it, it just drained uh, the sort of uh, vivacity of art for me. And, um, and then the sort of corporatization of uh, museums was also another uh, very, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't see that going away. Um, and then I, I was really a dedicated critic. Um, I, I edited a, a collection of Peter Sheldahl's writings and a collection of uh, Christopher Knight's writings. And, because I believe in the role of the public intellectual, but nobody wants to pay for criticism anymore. They want boosterism. They want PR. They do not want criticism. And I think that this is a huge problem in the art world. Because first of all, it makes people uh, wimpy. They don't say what they mean. And they're always being nice. And that doesn't make for, um, you know, that doesn't make for a vigorous uh, art world at all. I mean, even when I was working 15, 20 years ago, there were only nine newspapers in America that had full-time art critics. And if you go to any small town in, you know, Europe, they have art critics. You know, it's, and, um, and a lot of things are, I mean, there's a whole lack of, uh, I, I think everything rests on the shoulder of the artist. And yet I see, I mean, I just talked to my friend Christopher Knight at the LA Times two weeks ago, and he said this um, show that he loved that was down in um, San Diego had no catalog. I said, how can you ask an artist to work on a show for two or three years and not do a publication? That is a real falling down of museum institutions. If they can't afford to do the show and do a catalog and they, can't, and they don't even put it online, I think it is an abuse of the whole system because the artist has worked their entire life to do this art. And, and now museums, they're, I mean, I have to say, I've seen a realignment. When I started in the art world in the 70s, our pleasure was dealing with living artists. 
And then when I went to work in San, San Antonio, everybody was like, oh, well, you get to deal with the living artists. They're difficult. <laughs> Uh, we like to deal with the dead artists, you know? <laughs> and so that yeah, was... I had to kill a few artists from... <laughs> I know, I know, I know. That's not true, but I, that's true. But what I saw was an alignment of the museum staffs with their boards and the people who support them and not to the art. And I think that is a major problem right now in the art world. So those are some reflections on that. Um, I forgot the question, but I want to speak to Charlotte because you were talking about being a gallerist, and I think the whole role of the gallerist is demeaned and, and just almost unconsciously in the broader art community because you're associated with commercialism. Like we didn't get over that prejudice against buying and selling works of art a long time ago in our theory. Okay, but um, you know, gallerists really provide. Uh, they're just essential to the way uh, the world works. And I'll explain a little bit why that is, because if you, like some institutions, museum type institutions or Kunsthalles, do have curators that go to try look in every closet in Bulgaria and find the next big thing, but, um, um, but typically <laughs> without as much success. Uh, when gallerists have proven their worth in finding the new talent year after year since the beginning. Uh, they support artists um, in many big ways. Uh, if you look at someone like Leo Castelli, who just died a few years ago, one of the great gallerists uh, in New York who introduced Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, pop artists and things like that. Um, what you don't realize is uh, one of the artists he supported was Richard Serra, he did not make a dime off of Richard Serra for 20 years. For 20 years. He believed in the art. Now, you can't, I could, if I were working in a museum, I probably couldn't talk the director into, we're going to support Richard Serra for 20 years because he's really good. I believe it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, and, and also, you know, when you go into the gallery business, it is a huge risk. Are you kidding me? Uh, I mean, Everyone will tell you, you don't even think about it, you're not going to make a profit for three years. If you're really lucky, you might at that point begin to break even. That's huge risk. I mean, there are huge expenses. Uh, galleries do essential, not really, there's like great sometimes. No, they're essential to the way the arts develop uh, in our country and other countries. So, and what else was I talking about? <laughs> I forgot the question. Oh, the challenge. That's enough. Go ahead, Constance. <laughs> uh, so the challenge for artists, I would say just uh, staying alive, you know, yeah. physically in the beginning and, and mentally later on. It, that's, the, that's the biggest challenge, just keep keeping it going, figuring out how to do it in the beginning and then... Oh, that was what's the biggest challenge. Oh, okay, yeah, for... <laughs> Oh, getting paid. How do, you, how, do you <laughs> how do you identify yourself first and foremost? A um, professor, I, uh, a critic? Art writer, I guess. Okay. But um, yeah, I mean, I teach. But um, I teach, you know, I used to write a lot more regularly than I do now. But, you know, for a time, I'd write a lot for Art Forum. Uh, so I might have spent years learning about art to get to the level of expertise where I'd be writing for art forms on this really big topic or something. And then I'd write a couple of pages or three, four pages, and I would make $300. And it would have taken me two months to write. So uh, very few, you know, it's like, uh, like Malin says, there's about nine jobs for art critics in the, world, in the United States in which you can actually make a living at being an art critic. So, um, you know, yeah, a lot of, Survival. of um, you know, teaching positions are held, although I really actually enjoy teaching, so.